Hi, my name's Neil Davis from Digital Cloud Training. We've recently added a whole bunch of new questions to our Solutions Architects Associate Practice Exam course. So these are specifically questions relating to the new version of the exam, the SAA C02. Now, it's getting closer to the point where you'll no longer be able to take the C01. There's still a few more weeks, um, but that is happening soon. And I think a lot of people are starting to realize that they should study for the new version of the exam just to get ready for that change, or just simply because the feedback that's coming back from the exam is mostly very positive. So I've done the exam twice now. I did the beta exam, and then I also retook the exam using the final version a couple of weeks ago. And I definitely recommend people take the new version of the exam. There's a few new topics that you need to study, but overall, I found the experience wasn't any more difficult than the CO1, and if anything, I preferred the way the questions were worded. But they can be a little bit tricky, so you've got to watch out. And you've got to just read carefully and make sure you study properly and then read the questions carefully once you get into the exam. So what I want to do in this short video is walk you through a few exam questions that are typical of the CO2 exam and guide you through my process, how I try and work out what the correct answer is. So let's start this practice exam. And the first question is a new application is going to be published in multiple regions and an architect needs to ensure only two IP addresses needs to be whitelisted. And the solution needs to intelligently route traffic for lowest latency and also provide fast regional failover. So we've got an application that's going to be deployed in different locations in the world. And the architect just wants to have two IP addresses. So no matter where you are, those are the IP addresses, and that simplifies what they need to communicate out to the consumers. So let's have a look at the answers. Now, one of the first things I notice is that the wording up to this point here where we have NLB is the same for each answer. So it's always worth looking out and seeing what's the same across the answers. So it says launch EC2 instances into multiple regions behind AN and then NLB, and that's the same for each of these. So really, we just need to evaluate this last part of the question or the answer. So the first one is NLB with a static IP address. So yes, we can use static IP addresses with an NLB, so that works. But what about routing intelligently for lowest latency? Well, NLBs will just direct incoming connections to the target groups and the registered instances for those target groups. So it's not really doing intelligent routing or regional failover. It's a regional concept. So an NLB is within a region. It doesn't fail over to another region and it doesn't direct traffic to other regions either. So that's incorrect. So the next one is an ALB with a Route 53 failover routing policy. Well, failover routing is where you have a primary and then a standby. So you basically have failover when the primary resource is not available. So you use Route 53 health checks, and if the resource fails the health check, then it's assumed not to be available, and so you will fail over to the standby. Now, that's, you know, that's active-passive. So active-passive is not what we're looking at here because we're looking at intelligent routing for lowest latency. So that's not doing that. Maybe a latency routing policy would be a bit closer, but that's going to be a wrong answer. The next one is NLB with Global Accelerator. So Global Accelerator comes up quite a bit on the CO2 version of the exam. It's not on the CO1. It's a relatively new service, and it does do all the things that is being asked here. So with Global Accelerator, you have two static Anycast IP addresses. And so you can give those out to any of your customers, and then they'll be able to connect to your application. And yes, it does intelligent routing, it uses the AWS global backbone, so it's not routing over the internet, so you get lower latency. And it also does failover between regions as well. So that one looks like it fits all the criteria that we have here. So I'm going to select that one, and then let's check the last one here. So CloudFront with a pair of static IP addresses. Well, you can't put static IP addresses on CloudFront, so that's straight away not going to work. So I'm going to just click on check. And sure enough, that's the correct answer. And you can see I have a little diagram here just showing a topology that includes AWS Global Accelerator. So in this case, users go to Route 53, they get returned the static Anycast IP addresses, 
and then they get routed to an edge location which forwards them over the global backbone to one of the applications. In this case, the closest application is failed and so it will forward it to another region. And that's all over the global network. So that's that, let's move on to the next question. So this question says a solutions architect is creating a system that will run analytics on financial data for four hours a night, five days a week. And the analysis is expected to run for the same duration and can't be interrupted. It's gonna run for one year. And the question is really asking us, what can we do to reduce the cost? So what's the best EC2 pricing model for this particular workload? Well, so we're running for a year. So straight away that tells me that the best pricing model is likely to be a reserved instance because therefore one year or three years. So you have to lock into a contract for one or three years and you get a big discount. So I'm starting to go there straight away. Now it's gonna run four hours, it's not running 24 hours a day or seven days a week. It's only running on a specific schedule. So scheduled reserve instances sounds good because that means that I can use that allocation. So I'm not paying for all that time I'm not using. I have a recurring schedule that I can pay for. And again, I'm locking in for a year, so I'm getting great discounts. So standard reserved wouldn't be as cost effective. Spot instances, well, that's where you're using unused capacity on AWS. But you can run into a situation where AWS need the capacity back. And in that case, they're going to terminate your instance. And this can't be interrupted. So that wouldn't work. And on demand, you're not getting any discounts. So that's not really going to be cost effective at all. Not for when you're running the workload for a year. On demand is good for ad hoc use cases, but when you're running it for a year, that's not gonna be cost effective. So I hit check and sure enough, that's the correct answer. So let's move on to the next question. So an insurance company has a web application that serves users in the UK and Australia. It includes a data, so the application includes a database tier that uses MySQL and that's hosted in EU West 2. So the database is in UK. The web tier runs from EU West 2 and AP Southeast 2. So that runs from the UK and Australia. So we've got the yeah, database in the UK and then some web tier in the UK and also a web tier in Australia. Now Route 53 geo proximity routing is used to direct users to the closest web tier. So it's gonna direct users who are in the Southern Hemisphere, hopefully to the Australian web tier. And if you're closer to the UK, then it's gonna direct you to EU West 2 web tier. It's been noted that Australian users get slow response times to queries. So by queries, we're talking about the database here, right? So we're querying the database and the database is in the UK. So it's no wonder the Australian users get a slower response time. They're hitting the web tier on Australia, but then the actual requests to the database are going back to the UK. So what changes can we make to the database tier to improve performance? So let's go through these in order. Firstly, we can migrate the database tier to RDS to MySQL. Okay, that's possible. And then configure multi-AZ in the Australian region. Well, I'm not sure how that's gonna work. So does that mean you're migrating the whole database to Australia and then configuring multi-AZ in Australia? Doesn't really solve the problem. And then it causes a problem for users in Europe you know, the other way you could interpret that is that you're creating a multi-AZ copy in Australia from the database in the UK, but that doesn't work either because RDS does not support multi-AZ across regions. It's just across availability zones. So that answer doesn't work. So let's look at the next one. So migrate the database to DynamoDB. Straight away, I'm thinking that doesn't work because it's a non-relational database and we've got MySQL, which is a relational database. So that's not really a migration path you're gonna to wanna to take. It then says use DynamoDB global tables to enable replication to additional regions. Well, yes, you can replicate to additional regions, but DynamoDB is the wrong database type to use for this workload. So next up, deploy MySQL instances in each region and deploy an application load balancer in front of MySQL to reduce the load on the primary instance. Well, you can't put load balancers in front of databases. You put them in front of your web or application tier, so your EC2 instances. You can't put them in front of, of databases and then direct traffic to different database instances. 
So that's not going to work. So really interesting, we've gone through and I'm very sure that all three of these are wrong. I don't even know, I haven't even read the fourth answer yet, but I've straight away eliminated three. So that's a really good position to be in. Often you'll find that you can eliminate two and then there's one that's a bit tricky. In this case, we're in a good position because we've eliminated these three. So then migrate the database to an Aurora global database in MySQL compatibility mode, that's possible and configure read replicas in AP Southeast 2. Well, that makes a lot of sense because you can configure a read replica locally and that means the queries. So we're talking about reading here when you're querying a database, not writing. So we're not trying to improve write performance here, only read performance. And that's fine because a read replica will do that job. So I'm pretty sure that that's the correct answer. So sure enough, that's correct. And there's a bit of a diagram here and an explanation. And it shows us, you know, where you might have a Aurora database with the writes going in the primary region. And then you've got reads happening in the secondary region, which in this case would be the Australian region. So let's move on and do one more. A company stores important data in an S3 bucket. A solution architect needs to ensure the data can be recovered in case of accidental deletion. Which action will accomplish this? Okay, so we're not trying to prevent deletion from happening. Always remember that when you're reading these kind of questions, you're either trying to protect against the deletion happening in the first place, which might be something like multi-factor authentication, or you're trying to be able to recover in case somebody does delete something that was important. So the obvious one for me straight away is versioning. So I'm gonna select that. Sometimes I just select the answer that I think is correct. And then I go and try and work out what the other answers are and do they sound better or not. You use intelligent tiering when you don't really understand the access patterns for your workload. So it might fit onto different tiers and you might have objects getting moved around between different tiers. So that's what that will do. It will automatically move your objects to the correct tier for whatever is happening, whatever the performance requirements are for that particular object. Next up, we've got a lifecycle policy. So a lifecycle policy is a way that you can define a policy which determines what happens to your data. It gets moved from one tier to another, from one storage class to another storage class. For instance, archiving your data to Glacier. So yes, you can set up lifecycle policies that archive data, that move data to different storage classes and so on, but I'm not really gonna use that. I don't think that's better than using versioning for being able to recover in case of accidental deletion. We've then got cross-region replication. Well, does that help? Well, it does because we're creating a copy of our data and putting it in another region. But actually, cross-region replication relies on versioning. So you have to have versioning in the first place. And it's going to be another copy of your data. So it means that you're going to have to pay a bit more for your storage space because you've got a full set of data in that region plus all the versions of your data that are also stored in that region. So it's actually gonna double your storage costs. So in this case, I think versioning is the best answer. So I'm gonna click on check and versioning is the correct answer. And so that's it for this video and I'm gonna carry on and do some more questions which you can find in another video soon.